and welcome back to Creeps and Crimes Podcast. I'm Taylor. And I'm Morgan. And this is episode 56. 56. 56. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Jeez. we're just going, we don't have a ton to say. Um, just give a little blurb about your weekend. I'll give a little blurb um, We had mine. some friends come in town, Lexi and Bailey. We had a heck of a weekend. We drank a lot of booze. Hell yeah. And I cannot believe that I am drinking right now because it was... A lot. Okay, I'm still recovering. I'm in the recovery phase. She was not okay this weekend. Can't confirm. I know I was not. No. And what are you drinking? Go ahead and tell oh, them. Uh, 1911 Honey Crisp Cider. Yummy. And I'm drinking 19 Crimes Red Wine. But the um, I this weekend didn't really do much. I, 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 uh, I didn't really do a ton <laughs> this weekend. I just went and hung out with my in-laws and chilled literally the entire weekend. We went on a hike and we ended up in Teleco Plains at this place called Ironworks, which was dope restaurant and bar. You have to go check it out. The staff was amazing. Of course, we became friends with everybody, the head chef, the head hostess. You, you know how we do. The manager. And they like sit with us and chill in. Yeah, you know how me and Logan go one place and make 15,000 friends. But I, the reason why we're kind of rushing through our weekend is because we really wanted to talk about the amount of new listeners and followers that we have. I don't know wow. what happened, but thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you guys. And I wanted to give like a little blurb about the ones that we know that have reached out to us, that we've talked to, blah, blah, blah. So you want to go first with your friend? My go friend. ahead. Your new friend. Oh my gosh. So we were at a bar on Friday night. We were at Embassy Suites. We asked this girl to take our picture. Should I tell them the whole story? Yeah, it's just tell them the whole story. It's funny. I asked this girl to take our picture, and she's like, yeah, for sure, girl. Like, I can get all the angles. I'm like, nice, because you know what else yeah. you hate. You hate the B words that go up there and snap a pic, and they're like, here you go. And you're like, And you're like, um, really? Because I would have gotten on my knees for you. Yeah, anyway, like, that's so interesting because I hate that side of my face. <laughs> right? Really bad angle. Yeah. Anyway, she's snapping all these pics. She took great, incredible pictures, and jokingly, I'm like, Damn, girl, I said, you got a card? Like, I'm going to call you in. Yeah. I haven't even picture um, taken. We have a podcast. And she goes, oh, yeah, no, I have a card. Proceeds to pull a card out of her purse, right? Her name is Asia White. Asia, if you're listening to this. Hi, Asia. Asia. So nice to meet you. She's, she's a voice actress, and she has her own studio in Knoxville, and she's an actress. And I was like, oh, you have your own studio? And she's like, yeah. I was like, me too. And she's like, oh, really? Well, what did you do? Or what do you do? And I was like, oh, I have a podcast. You should definitely follow it. And she did. So she, yeah, and she's like legit. Like there's stuff with her on HGTV and everything. Yeah, like. Amazon. She runs stuff like that. So it was really cool. So really cool. hopefully she can help us out with some sound stuff. Yeah, a little blurb. Go follow her. We always need it. Yeah, we <laughs> always need it. Um, and then when I was at Ironworks, I got to know this one guy was just talking to us about the dogs, my um, mother-in-law's dogs. And we got to talking about whitewater rafting. And I talked about my experience with whitewater rafting. He's a guide. Or, and, um, you know, we, we got to talking about something. Oh, they're putting on a whitewater rafting festival. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. I actually have a podcast that, like, primarily, not exclusively, is in East Tennessee. And we have a ton of listeners in East Tennessee. So when you run this, I would love to come to it. And I could run you, like, an ad and talk about it on my podcast if me and my co-host could come. And he was like, oh, absolutely. Great. So yes. I'm whitewater rafting. No, we're not going to go whitewater rafting. We're going to go drink with a bunch of guides and cool people and, you know, hang out. I thought you said a bunch of guys. I'm like, oh, we're taking. Yo, we're taking. Yeah. So, <laughs> we're going to uh, go drink with a ton of guys. It's going to be so fun. We're going to party it up. <laughs> so, right, we get to talking. Fun. They follow us on, like, everything. And then I got a message from him this morning. And he was like, oh, my God, girl. I listened to your latest episode, and I am obsessed with you guys. Oh, my god! And I was like, shut up. I'm crying. Well, as I'm at this restaurant, I we get a DM on our uh, Creeps and Crimes account yes. from a new listener talking about how they found us, and they loved listening, and talked about, like, come hanging out when we're in Knoxville. I'm like, hell her yeah. Is, her name is Brooke. We'll read the DM real yes. quick. She said, hey, I just wanted to say I found your podcast on Apple, and I just wanted to say I'm obsessed. 
You guys are so fun to listen to, and it makes my hour drive to work in the morning so worth it. Please, please, please never stop being, you guys. I don't know where. I don't know where you guys are coming from. But, like, but I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> if you're not on our Patreon, you don't And, get that. <laughs> honestly, our downloads are, are crazy. In Insane I right am now. just shook. Like, I can't believe this many people are listening to us. So, thank you for listening. And then one more thing I wanted to mention. I wanted to give a little bit of a shout-out. Sorry, my phone is dying, and this is what's controlling our microphone, so I'm trying to fix it. Well, good thing I brought your charger. Like, yeah. Stole for a couple weeks. <laughs> that you don't even have a box for. I didn't even know. Um, so... I hop on my Instagram the other day um, after we did the meet your host post mm -hmm. and I had a DM from this girl named Katie that I'm not going to tell the last name on here because I didn't ask for permission to but um, my husband went to school with and I've pretty much known her my whole life just through cheerleading and you know stuff like that and she's like hey I just want to let you know that I love your podcast, and now me and all my coworkers are obsessed with you guys. No they listen way. every day. Every Thursday they listen to us in their office. So naturally, I'm freaking out, and I'm like, that is the nicest thing that anybody's ever said to me. Like, yeah. thank you. So hi, Katie, and hi, all of your friends. Hi, Katie and coworkers. It's so, I'm so glad to have you guys listening. Um, Maybe, is it just because it's spooky season? It, it's definitely because it's spooky se season, for sure. People are absolutely loving creepy podcasts right now so on that note be sure you send this this is your goal for this week you send her you share our podcast with one of your friends or family members and you tell them that if they don't like it then you're no longer their friend or family <laughs> I'm just kidding I'm that you are exiling them from your entire life <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding but also please should go ahead and share it with yeah. at least one person and if you don't already, follow us on social media. So you have our Instagram, um, Morgan's personal. We haven't done this in a minute. Oh, my gosh. Morg.m, double the G. Double the G, And then R-G-G -G dot M. <laughs> follow it. And then mine is Taylor J with an A. And you can go ahead and follow Ollie's World. Yep, you can. Go ahead and hit that up one up because <laughs> it's really cute. And then you can hit up our social media for the podcast. Right, the important ones. Yeah, Crazy <laughs> Crimes Podcast on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, creeps underscore crimes. crimes. TikTok is Creeps and Crimes. Our Facebook page, go give it a like. It's Creeps and Crimes Podcast. And then join our Patreon. <laughs> Thank you to those that have joined. Y'all We just keep getting notifications. We're like, dang, people love us. Let's love it. Go. There's two bonus episodes on there right now. It's National Parks Part 2, Lundy Murder Part 1, Lundy Murder Part 2, and a Haunted Castles. Haunted Castles Castle special, Yay. which is hilarious. And so. then a major rant from us at the end. Um, and then a bunch of blooper reels, some cute notes from us, and there's plenty more coming because we just mapped our, out our entire next three months, so we are not okay. <laughs> not okay. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're listening on podcast, any podcast platform, Pop over to our YouTube and just give us a little subscribe. That'd be really kind of you. That's cool. All right. So, Morgan, hit him with it. If you're driving, throw that shit on cruise control. If you've got a glass, pour that shit up. And let's get creepy. Okay, Morgan, what do you have for me today? Oh my goodness. Not them, just me. Do I have the story for you, Miss Taylor? Just me. I, you guys, I cannot even believe that I came across something like this today. It, I'm still just like mind blown that this kind of thing exists in the world. And it all started with the Travis Wallen UFO case. And I guess actually that's wrong. It's the National Park conspiracy yeah. case. And my research there led me to a woman who wrote about her experience with extraterrestrials. So Taylor and I, we always use each other as notepads. Yes. And so I sent her the name, but I'm looking through my text today. I couldn't find it. And I, I could have sworn it was at the end of the Travis Walton case. So I'm listening to the podcast. I couldn't find it. But anyway, regardless, this woman, she wasn't, she didn't have your typical extraterrestrial experience. She had written a book on having something called hybrid children. So today, of course, like I said, I couldn't think of her name, so I'm Google searching hybrid children, woman writes book on having alien kids, and you guys, I come across an entire community of women 
who believe they have extraterrestrial children. Literally. Shut up. No, Literally I was going to do my case just on this woman, but no, like, this is, like, as a whole. This like, is, like, an entire thing. Yeah. An entire, entire thing. So I... Are we going to be in this group by the end of this? <laughs> I'll get there. Oh, so this God. website I come across, it's a community program for these women. It has private discussion boards, retreats. They have painting boards where women will paint or draw, sketch what they believe their child to look like. So I'm just like jaw drop scrolling through this website and basically on the website, of course nothing in this world is free. So if you pay $97 and you have access to all the following, you can connect with your hybrid child, you can remember your galactic heritage and soul mission, you can bond with like-hearted soul family, rekindle your own inner child, cultivate your extrasensory abilities and develop your ability to trust yourself and use your intuition. So with this, you, you achieve this right. when they, they offer three different types of meditation. One to find your inner child, another to connect and communicate with your hybrid children, and a third for ET general contact. And you guys, I was, Taylor, not you guys, no, Taylor. You guys shut you. up. <laughs> it's me. I was really about to drop $100 to see what this was all about. Oh, shit. Because for a second... The website genuinely had me convinced that I had a hybrid child. <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah, I'm like, holy shit. Because it literally said, like, do you have hybrid children? Well, if you accidentally came across this page, chances are you do. I'm like, well, check mark. That's me. I'm like, holy shit, do I drop $100 right now to find out about my hybrid kids? Pause, because, guys, this is what's happened on my end today. <laughs> I get a FaceTime from Morgan. Morgan doesn't call me. I call Morgan. And normally because she just expects me to call, so she's yeah, like, I'm not going to call her. She'll be fine. And I get a call from her, and I'm like, I'm on the phone with my mom. I'm like, hold on, Morgan's called me. I have to go. Something's <laughs> wrong. So I like hang up with my mom, and she answers the phone. She's like, you're going to die about my story today. I'm like, shut up. Hang up the phone. She's like, by the way, do you remember what that woman's name was? <laughs> <laughs> Hybrid kid. I'm like, oh, this is bad. And also, Morgan doesn't spend money, okay? So the fact that they were about to have you drop $100, right? <laughs> no way. Like, the website was very, very persuasive. Anyway. We'll drop it in the show notes. Well, I'm, I'm going to mention it, but yeah, okay. we'll link it to the Good show note. notes. Today, I will be talking about hybrid children, who they are, how they came about, and what yeah. their purpose is. My sources for today, um, the website I just talked about is www.hybridchildrencommunity.com, where if any of our listeners feel like dropping a band to see if they have hybrid children, you can head right there. Or you can head to our Patreon. We'll tell you the same. <laughs> <laughs> My other sources are abc15.com, dailymail.co.uk, bridgetnelson.com, and nbcnews.com. So what are hybrid children, often called star kids? Okay. The belief of hybrid, hybrid children stem from the idea that we humans are hybrids ourselves. Ooh. This community believes that the human race is a blend of hybrids that were created over a millennia ago from many different cosmic civilizations. These civilizations include the Pleiadians, the Syrians, not from the country Syria, Arcturians, Orion, Zeta Reticuli, Upsilos, and Venetians. So I'm, I'm not really worried about the pronunciation. Right, like who's going to correct us? <laughs> Aliens are gonna leave yeah. a review. You pronounce my cosmic lack of detail. Wrong. Lack of detail. <laughs> Zero stars. The idea that all humans are hybrids come from the belief that back in the day, the indigenous ape was combined with genetic material from extraterrestrials, okay. and over time became your average human. Hybrid children are a genetic blend of human and extraterrestrial DNA from any of the cosmic civilizations that I just read off. Currently, these children reside in a different dimension, while some do live on motherboard spaceships waiting for the right time to come home to their parents. Got it. Mostly, every person on Earth is involved in the hybridization program. Great. Okay, all of this information, like, this is, like, not factual. This is just from the community. Okay, so, like, <laughs> this is not scientifically tested. Yeah, <laughs> correct. But in the physical reality, only a select few humans remember making this soul agreement before they were entered into this lifetime. 
The purpose of the hybridization program is to awaken humankind to our infinite expressions and reunite us with our galactic family. <laughs> so it's like when like you see like past lives and you're like, oh, well, you, you know, you're up there for a really long time before you enter your next past life. Yeah. Like they, they say that this is where this is what you are going to reunite with. Like whatever you are up there and you're not in the reality of right. Earth, that's your family that they're Got talking it. about. So hybrid children are also the gateway to the future, meaning any apocalyptic occurrence or event, hybrid children will come to Earth and bring it back to its prosperous and life-giving planet. During the hybridization process years ago, there were five different hybrid races created, one of which, called the Shalanaya, Shalanaya civilization, who is said to be the first to make open contact with Earth. So when these hybrid children come, the Shalanaya. Sorry, Martians. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Martians. They will be the first to visit here. So they reside on their motherboard ship known as the Phoenix Lights, which is actually a very popular um, spaceship that is reported. Okay. And it was actually spotted in Arizona in March of 1997. Got it. Children known as freelancers, which means they are immediate genetic children, they are hosted with the Shalanaya, sorry Martians, and live on their ships with them. So they're not in a different dimension like the rest of the hybrid children. Got it. This group of children are not part of the hybrid civilization, but instead the human civilization because of their immediate genetics. Okay. They will grow to mate with our children here on Earth, which will then create a sixth hybrid race, and that will be called the galactic humans. Got so it. when we're like ready to like ascend and like move beyond our Earth, like we will be called the galactic humans. But it's only gonna happen after we mate with this certain semi-hybrid civilization that's gonna come first heard okay isn't this just this insane? is out of this world literally literally. <laughs> literally out of the world so this community believes that we are either hybrid children ourselves or that we have hybrid children without knowing it the goal of this program is to one day reunite with our families that go beyond our world and this is supposed to happen as early as 2022 quickly as you would think. Hybrid children will be first introduced by the use of media, Netflix shows, movies, comics, things like that. Which, do you know the Netflix show I'm talking about where the kids are literally hybrids to animals and they're like, the human race is like hunting them. I forget what it's called, but you think I watched that? Well, it, it was on like the top chart, so I'm sure you flip past it. <laughs> it goes straight to grades in right. private practice. By the year 2030, hybrid children will come to Earth and live in very discreet and small communities. They will land and live in sacred sites. Most commonly, they will be at chakra points on the Earth. Shut and up. And vortexes that are here on Earth. It's time for the chakra episode. Yeah, I think so too. These communities will be protected by extremely high government officials. They will also be located in pristine and isolated locations around the planet. The communities will be created by humans who have raised their vibrations to a level where they can interact with higher frequencies of the hybrids. So the hybrids are on like a whole nother um, frequency so vibration. So we're going to talk to them. So they're, the only way that, okay, well, this is like, we would be the ones creating it because we would be aware, like, we would have had, like, astral projection and, like, had this knowledge and whatever. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. You guys know what I'm trying to say here. But, yeah, they can only come if enough people on Earth have ascended into this higher vibration. Or else we won't, we'll never be ready and we'll, we'll kill them. Which leads us to the Monroe Institute. Right. Bruh. 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 Um, where am I? <laughs> it is believed that those in the upper government, they have this capability of reaching these vibrations through the Monroe Institute. <laughs> the Monroe Institute and the knowledge of the timeline hybrid children will touch down to Earth. So these upper government officials, these high government officials, they know this is happening and they might even be here, according to this community, that they might have already been infiltrated in, like back in. 2015. We'll oh. talk about that a little bit more. Once, sorry, once the children have acclimatized to some degree, they will then begin to interact with a larger part of society. So they'll be kept in these isolated communities and they'll be worked with by humans to be like, okay, we do this here, we do this here, we do this here. But also, I'm like, well, then that defeats their purpose of coming. 
Right. Like, if we're, they're just going to adapt to us, like, shouldn't we be adapting to them? I think we eventually will, but they have to accept us for. I mean, we have to accept them first. Right. And once okay. accepted by the world, they will move out and be on their own. Okay. It is believed that they will bring peace to the human race and allow for humans to live their remaining years as their natural selves. So, like, there's not going to be, like, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, there's not going to be wars. There's not going to be, like, you have debts to pay. Like, everyone's just going to be, like, like, what you picture heaven to be like, that's what they're going to bring here to Earth. <laughs> what, you don't think? Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't think that's going to happen it. by January? Yeah, that's that's totally what's coming. You know, we're, we're at a great place, America specifically. You know, we're yeah, killing we're it. really, we're literally killing it. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows for sure when they will come because there are many timelines of how the landing will occur and when we as humans will expand our vibrational frequency so that we can provide the energy that the children will need. And it could have already began in 2015, but it could begin as late as 2033. But it is expected that many people alive today will have the privilege of greeting the hybrid children when they touch down here on Earth. So what are these children like? The hybrid children are unique. They are very intelligent and they know who they are. They know their essence, they know their gifts, and they understand the reality that they exist in. They're aware of how different dimensions work. They are aware of what their duty is when they touch down here on Earth. And it is believed that they are extremely excited to reunite with their mothers, according to their mothers who talk to them all the time. All yeah, the time. got it. Understood. And once this awakening with humans occur, we will understand and then proceed to accept them, and then we will match the reality that they have always lived in. Each child is very much like a human, different in their own way. They can be quiet, outgoing, energetic. They can be a musician, a healer, an artist, an animal communicator, yada, 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 the list goes on. Like, things that, you know, aren't your normal, average, human right. day, day things. Different children are will de eat different foods. Those with lower vibrations are most likely to be vegetarians and vegans. Children that have higher frequencies will consume only organic living liquids, whatever that means. And some will not eat at all because they will receive their nutrition for just from the electromagnetic field of Earth. Can I be one of those? Can, can I be a member of the ones that don't eat? <laughs> can I be the members of the ones that are skinny? Please. <laughs> skinny club. And this is why they're not coming, right? Yeah, they're like, actually, we, we are, are not ready. That they're, yeah, they're not, we're not ready. They're like, mm, no. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, at this point, our... Um, Sorry, no, not at this point. Sorry. This was more convincing in my notes. <laughs> but this is what happened. Now at this point, are there women out there like, shit, if this is real, I hope I have a hybrid kid. Honestly, I hope I do. It, okay, imagine this was, okay, think for a second. Imagine this okay. was real. And wouldn't you be like, well, shit, I hope women's mind, like they came and they just like changed, altered the earth and altered the world. Wouldn't you want one of them to be yours? I mean, something? yeah, but then mine would be the dumbass one that has ADD and, like, can't Oh, get... they don't have ADD. They might, if it's my kid. Yours would be, like, a healer. <laughs> it would, and it would be, like, cleansing all the way properties. It's like, hey, um, we're just stopping by to do a quick cleansing that my mom sent me. Um, but I was going to say to you, when you were talking about, like, what they were eating, that kind of gives off the culty vibe of that woman that says you fulfill your hunger with prayer. You know what? With the big hair uh -huh. and the skinny. It was like causing... She just died like a few years ago. What yeah. is that woman's name? It's a cult. You're going to have to cover that one soon. That one's a good one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Continue. I do know what you're talking about. So how do these women get these urges that they have? How tell us, children. Ladies. Tell. Let me tell you. If you have reoccurring dreams that you are pregnant or dreams in classroom settings or doctor's offices or, for example, dreams that this pregnancy got transferred into your body, like me, I'm telling Morgan. you, I'm, Morgan. Reading this, I'm reading this website, I'm like, holy shit, I have a hybrid kid. You guys, I'm not <laughs> shitting you. Morgan has called me every day this week. I had a dream that I was pregnant. I had a dream that my baby was Not even this week. I, it's been, it's been like month. three, like, yeah. It's been a hot It's been month. as long as she's had the headache that <laughs> she's had for as, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, I have, I have hybrid kids out there. You do have hybrid kids. <laughs> oh my God, I'm a mother. 
Bitch, I'm a mother. No drama. No drama. <laughs> okay. Oh so, my god. But this is the point. Yeah, I was like, holy shit, pregnancy dreams every single night. That's why. You are a good kid. Anyway, I'm an aunt. If you have dreams like that, then there is a good chance that you do have a hybrid child, according to this community. Sorry, Marley, you weren't the first to have a dreams. A lot kids. of these interactions, sexual interactions and interactions with children, the sexual interactions are with the, I'm going to talk about that, and you're going to be like, are we on call her daddy? I'm, I'm so, so scared. scared. <laughs> I'm terrified. At this point, children in the cars, turn your ears off. Or in the living room, turn your ears off. I hope you're not letting your children listen to these two dumbasses. But, <laughs> I mean, if you are, more power to you. I'd like if my you kids too. To yeah, yeah. So a lot of these interactions occur in like a dreamlike state. So these women aren't reporting like, I got lifted up into this UFO. No, they're saying I had a dream of this, this, and this, and I can't. So and then I'm big into med. They're big spiritualists. They do meditations, and each time they go into like this meditation, they see these children or like they have dreams that they're in this classroom setting like teaching kids that don't look like humans and like they all have the same experiences it's freaking crazy that is dude. insane um <laughs> anyway mothers in this hyper child community say that they communicate with their children when they dream some say that they'll shift dimensions when they are asleep like they'll just get like sleepy and have to take a nap mm -hmm. and when they're napping they'll shift into these dimensions without knowing to help assist their children with lessons that they'll need in order to adapt to our society here on Earth, or if their children just really need to see them. Isn't that freaking crazy? That is crazy. <laughs> okay. These lessons are called Humans 101, where in their dimension, mothers are summoned to visit their children and may wake up to never even recall and just thought that they had, like, a good night's sleep or, like, a, you know, like, they yeah. just may never remember it, but they're yeah. dreaming about it. Bridget Nelson is the advocate for hybrid children. She runs this group. She... Okay, is Bridget. The, she is the queen bee, the mother of the hybrids. Not really, but I think she might think she is. And urges the world to accept them when they decide to switch dimensions. A little bit about Bridget. She currently lives in Sedonia, Arizona, and she is an intuitive healer. She specializes in uniting our metaphysical reality with our modern world. She is a published author and an international speaker, pr promoting messages for those who are already awakened. Bridget hosts retweet, retweet, retweets, <laughs> retweets, <laughs> retreats for mothers in the hybrid child community. When asked about the benefits of embracing hybrid children, Bridget said, this is why you should embrace them if they ever come. One of the questions that came up for me in the exploration of children integrating into our society is why people would want to welcome these children into their homes and embrace them in their lives. Of course they are a family, they are our children, but what else will happen by creating a home for them? This, of course, is a very human question, but important to address. The answer came to me that these children are incredibly beautiful beings with very high, loving vibrations. They are step-up transformers, which will accelerate our consciousness, our hearts, and ascension process. They will add an infinite and unimaginable amount of love, expansion, wonder, joy, creativity, and peace to our lives. In my opinion, it will be the greatest gift imaginable to welcome a hybrid child into our lives. She honestly needs to go work for, like, some adoption company. <laughs> right? Guys, like, let's take care of her own kids. Yeah, let's go ahead and take care of the ones that we have on her. But I like where you're going with this speech. Like, that does sound pretty sweet. Like, you're a good salesperson, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I'm here for this fully on board. If this is true, like, I hope that we would get to experience this. Right. And like, I hope it would be happen in our lifetime. Anyway, let's keep talking about Bridget because she makes for a very interesting life. I'm ready. Bridget believes that extraterrestrials only take women who want to be taken or want to be loved. She currently lives with her father but claims she has regular contact with aliens and she currently has 10 hybrid children. Four boys and six girls. To Tell each you. their own. Unlike many of the women in the community, Bridget can recall her sexual experience with the extraterrestrial that got her Pregnant. Oh, let's hear it. Saying it was the best sex of her life. Whatever it does it for you, girl. Out of this world, baby. Out of this world. Well, it was great. It was an incredible, super primal, and super raw experience. I don't know where we're going with the raw. Don't even say anything. I know you wanted to. I know you wanted to. Um, there was really freedom, and we were really going for it. It was the best sex I ever had. <laughs> Look, 
I am not a sex shamer ever. I am a ve very, very, very sex positive person. <laughs> this is crazy. I mean, if that's what you and your toy need to imagine to get where you need to go, girly, go ahead. More Kill power it. To you, yeah. More power to you. Proud of you, actually. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that I could ever say that out loud. Right? <laughs> Bridget draws pictures of her children. She has contact them with them during meditations and dream states, and she hopes that one day in her lifetime she can be reunited with them. But until then, her goal is to orchestrate the coming of hybrid children and preparing humans for acceptance. So here, if you're watching YouTube, a couple pictures of Bridget and her children, <laughs> her alien kids. So cute. Love Cuties! Them. She says that aliens tend to take people from the same family or gene pool and that most extraterrestrials are interested in breeding with younger generations of women. Great. So teenagers. Great. Love that. Yeah. Love that yeah. for everybody. That's very, very, very appropriate. I was about to say when you were talking about, um, you said something earlier and I was like, this is getting kind of rapey. Like, honestly, this is getting kind of out of Wait hand. till I tell you the next sex story. Oh, no. Um, but the community of these women, they do consist of 19 to 60 year old women. So Bridget believes as that long as they're above 18. Yeah. Bridget believes, maybe she just added that. Yeah, yeah. she's like, e no. She believes that aliens usually take women aboard on their spaceships where they become impregnated or artificially inseminated. But it can also happen here on Earth. She says she recalls one experience of seeing a ship in the sky and moments later, period cramps and pain where her ovaries are located. She blacked out. But Bridget isn't the only one with these experiences. A woman named Aluna Versa claims to have remembered her sexual experience as well. Aluna Versa is 23 years old and is a video game designer. And she is a mother of three hybrid children. And her sexual experience is very vivid. It happened to her in a dream state where she dreamed that she was in a classroom setting with other humans. Oh, God. Quote. You're not ready for this. All of a sudden, I'm sat next to this green reptilian creature, and immediately I'm so sexually turned on <laughs> just by looking at this being. Quit laughing. If they ever listen to this, they're going to sue us. I was very surprised. Next thing I know, we're making love in this classroom in front of everyone. Everyone turned their attention to us. It sounds crazy, and people have asked if I'm off my meds, but it was really happening. It was real to me. <laughs> so she just looked at this being, and she was like, Holy shit, can we fucking we fucking talk? <laughs> Are you telling me that every sex dream we've ever had is real? <laughs> Dude, that's okay, I didn't mention that, but no, that was on their website that sex dreams are signs that you have these kids. <laughs> okay, me and Steven Tyler have some kids that are <laughs> But you know sex dreams get crazy. They get crazy. Oh, I do that so much. Um, Aluna also interacts with her children through dreams and meditations, and she has sketched what she believes they look like up here on the YouTube people. <laughs> together, Bridget and Aluna have plans to create a space where all hybrid mothers can live together in the same area. This will act as a safe place for when their children are finally able to come and visit Earth. We're getting cold tea. Bridget says it will be somewhere away from the cities. Very culty. People say we are crazy. This is a quote. People say we are crazy, but we are not. This is really happening to us. And I am going to throw in some scientific um, arguments here just because this website, these two women, you're still kind of like, that's reaching, man. Like, that's really reaching. And it is. But it's not just these mothers who believe this. According to NBC, University of Oxford in Engler. Engler. <laughs> University of Oxford in England, Professor Young Hai Chai claims aliens are creating alien-human hybrids as a hedge against climate change. So to support his claim, he says that the number of reported alien abductions has risen in the last several decades. He believes that there is a common explanation for these breeding experiments, and there's two. Number one, aliens are in a reproductive bind on their home world, meaning they can no longer successfully procreate and so they have come to Earth to use humans as basically incubators to get their offsprings. And number two, aliens are producing hybrid beings that will somehow help them awaken our planet. 
During his study, he links the number of abductions reported to... This is interesting, actually. Okay, I'm ready. He links the number of abductions reported, alien abductions that were reported, to the increase in the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is climate change. Got it. He said that the abduction itself is not responsible for global warming, but instead these increase of, of abductions are a reaction to global warming. Professor Chai, or Kai, sorry, claims that ETs are producing hybrids that can better withstand a, like, toastier or warmer planet. Okay. And they need our DNA to do so. They are creating, basically, a new model of homo, homo sapiens. This would eliminate the need for elaborate geoengineering projects to save our Earth, all while helping the aliens, because they're selfish, who are said to be living among us by preserving their part of their DNA that's carried by temperature-tolerant hybrids. Okay. So basically, his theory is that while we are here destroying our planet, they need our DNA to reproduce. Okay. So they are doing some type of genetic testing to create a hybrid that can further, re like they can't reproduce right now, so they need us. But we're destroying our planet. We're not going to be here forever. So they're, they need to create hybrids with us that can still reproduce but still survive on another planet. Okay, so my question here is if they can't reproduce... Sorry, my phone is going crazy right now. If they can't reproduce because of something that they did, who are they to come and tell us how to take care of our planet? Right. And then seal our DNA. Right. So, hypocrites? <laughs> Much? I think so. I think Just so. Just a little theory. Just a little side tay theory, okay? Which can be the case of why, like, this could be potentially the cause why these women are experiencing the feeling that they have hybrid children and out then, in the world. And then, if there's a spike in climate change, which, by the way, I'm not debunking climate change whatsoever. Right. It is a real thing, and it's something Absolutely, yeah. you have to recycle and take care of our planet, because if not, we're all just going to die in a, like, fiery burst one day. But, or drown. Um, but, but, like, you really can't fix our planet for us. Like, like, you really can't, like, have the technology be like, do climate change fix. Right. But it also, if the increase is around the same time as carbon carbon monoxide or dioxide, di dioxide mm -hmm. in the air, that as the same time, like, they're coming to visit us and it's also aligned with climate change, how do we know that they're not the ones causing our climate change? Right. I do know that America, not Americans, like, Earthlings, we're shitty, we don't take care of our planet. Yeah. But are what if they're coming? I mean, this is totally. I'm. I mean, I'm off. Right. Off. I don't Keep think. Going. I don't think he's like that. Um, specifically, like tagging, like oh, this day had really high carbon dioxide, okay. right? and this was an increase. It was just like as the years progress, we're seeing more and more and more abductions, as we're seeing an increase in climate change. Mm -hmm. Is what he's saying. Okay, got it. So same, but different. <laughs> Um, that's right. it for me, guys. More on my segment. You might have some alien kids out there, and if you don't, alien children are coming. So make sure you accept them, and that you heard it here first on Creeps and Crimes Podcast. Cha-ching! Hat <laughs> time! What a hell of a segment. I loved it. And I hated, hated it. it. I can't stop laughing. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, Google, whatever, Podbean, whoever... <laughs> just pop over to our YouTube and watch this, okay? Because it is wanna. me sobbing, crying the entire time away from my mic. Yeah, so, so that's all I have, guys. It was something that definitely needed to be talked about. It absolutely needed to be talked about. Like, is that a conspiracy theory? <laughs> I don't know what that would or be. Or was I true. literally just shining light on a cult? Or <laughs> is this cult activity, is this conspiracy theory, or is this just history? I mean... <laughs> We don't know. Who knows, but you know what? You heard it here first from Crips and Crimes Podcast. Signing off. Ad time. Ad time. Looking to start your spiritual journey or connect with a loved one that has passed? Psychic medium Susan Edwards with Angel Wings and Healing Things has the ability to kickstart your spiritual awakening. Susan has 30 years of experience and is a certified angelic medium with a passion for speaking to deceased loved ones while leading you on your spiritual journey. Being a holy fire Karuna Reiki master and working with sound therapy, Susan has the ability to teach you all of the skills you need to protect, release, and grow your energy. I personally have been seeing Susan 
since December of 2019. Throughout our time working together, she has brought me peace with my loved ones, helped me connect to my guides, and cleansed myself and my home many of times. Want to connect with your past life? Susan is a certified consulting hypnotist that has the ability to do just that. Susan is located in Knoxville, Tennessee and offers in-person or over-the-phone readings. Because of the amazing lessons, readings, and healings that we have gotten, Taylor and I have decided to partner with Susan to bring you the same level of peace that she has delivered to us. To receive 10% off of your first reading with Susan, message Angel Wings and Healing Things on Facebook or text 704-562-3476 to set up your appointment telling her that we sent you. You might need it after listening to us. That is 10% off your first reading. Message Angel Wings and Healing Things on Facebook or text 704-562-3476. And tell her we sent you. Ah! East Tennessee people, listen up. Do you have an engagement, graduation, or wedding coming up? Or do you just want to spice up your social media? Look no further because we have the photographer for you. Best Picks is a Knoxville-based photographer that is down to travel, hype you up, and show off your smile. Lexi is the photographer that brought us our season two photos and new logo. So we know she's amazing. Feel good about the money you spend on a photographer by choosing Best Picks. She is a voice for those who are not heard and works hard to give her clients the best sessions possible. With her confidence boosting morale and kind heart, you won't just get a session, but a friend for life. You can find Lexi on Instagram and Facebook at Best Picks or her website, bestpicks.com. To book your session today, email alexandra.best.king at gmail.com. You won't regret it. L-I-T-B, sister! Did you miss our lash ads? Well, guess what? We are back with even more. Afterlife Lash Extensions is a Knoxville-based lash studio that offers everything from classics to super volume. Not in Knoxville? Or would you rather have falsies? Afterlife Lashes has it all with their own strip lashes for sale on Instagram at Afterlife Lashes. All of their products are foam mink, silk material that is vegan, cruelty-free, and is sent to you in a reusable coffin packaging that is so cute and so on brand. With three years experience and a three-time certified lash artist, Afterlife Lashes is here to give you the best experience possible. Take a nap on their ultra soft lash beds with great music and even better vibes. Use our code Creeps and Crimes to get 40% off your entire order of falsies on AfterlifeLashes.com. To book an extension appointment, DM Afterlife Extensions on Instagram and mention Creeps and Crimes podcast to receive 40% off any service offered. Happy lashing! Okay, so if you skip through our ads, shame on you. Just <laughs> back it up to. because <laughs> I'm just kidding. Shut up. Because we added a new one, and you don't want to miss it. Yeah, it's something you're really gonna want to take up. So. And I don't know a lot of podcasts that do an ad like this, so yeah. I'm sure that you're not gonna want to miss this. So with all that being said, Ooh. let's get. Try me. What do you have for us? Today I'm covering, as promised, the Austin Ewart Shop murders. Ooh. So this is somewhat of a part two um, of my last episode, episode 55. I covered the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. And this has like some connections with it. So I'm not saying that you have to go listen to that right now to understand what's going on in here, but I am going to be making a few connections and references so you could always go back and listen. So she is saying go back and listen to this. <laughs> so go listen to it, but I'm not saying that you're going to be super lost. I'm just saying you're going to be like, what are they talking about um, towards the end? So let's get started. My sources for today are in That's Why We Drink podcast, Crime Junkie podcast, Wikipedia, um, go San Angelo News, True Crime File Files, USA Today, KVUE News, TrueCrimeEdition.com, CBS News, Morbid Tourism, The Chapter on YouTube, ForensicTales.com, Statesman.com, Newspaper.com, Unresolved.com, Oxygen.com, New York Times, and 48 Hours. So let's get started. This story takes place on Friday, December 6, 1991, at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop in Texas. Austin, Texas. Hell of a name. I know, right? It's it's a mouthful a little bit. Um, Minutes before midnight, a police officer, Troy Gay, 
was patrolling the West Anderson Lane when he notices that the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop was engulfed in flames and he calls it in at 1148. Fire trucks and police flood the scene soon after this is called in. And once firefighters are able to put out the fire, they entered the building looking for any evidence as to what could have started this fire. Upon entering, they stumble on the last thing they were expecting to find. As they are looking around at the front of the shop with lights, one of the firefighters turns to his chief and says, is that a foot? Laying there on the floor were the bodies of four women three stacked on each other, and the fourth was on the other side of the counter. Oh my gosh. As soon as the bodies were discovered, Sergeant John Jones of the homicide unit was called onto the scene. When he got the call, he was actually doing a ride-along with a local news crew that was featuring a story on Texas crime that was influenced by the 1990 Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre that I covered last week. How convenient. So right before this call, Sergeant Jones was telling the crew, like, I don't think you're going to have a lot of things being called in that's, like, major crime. Like, we're a pretty quiet city. And at the time, like, Austin wasn't as big as we think it is now. Like, it was still sort of a small town feel, low crime rates, and so on. And by crime rates, I mean, like, murders. Like, murders weren't just right. happening all the time. So... As this, as we're having this conversation, he's telling the news crew, like, but don't worry, you're going to Houston tomorrow, so you're going to be good. Like, yeah. you'll get you'll all the crime you want there. So as he's saying this, literally, boom, this call comes in. So when Sergeant Jones arrives on the scene with an entire news crew, he went to investigate the bodies. The women were badly burned, naked, gagged, and bound. Each of the women had been shot in the head, meaning that they were dead before the fire was started. So whoever started the fire was trying to cover up these murders. Which sounds a lot like the Las Cruces Bowling Alley. Right. So upon further investigation, it was determined that these bodies belonged to four teenage girls. Oh my goodness. Employees at the shop and best friends, 17-year-old Jennifer Harbinson and 17-year-old Eliza Thomas, as well as Jennifer's 15-year-old sister, Sarah Harbinson, and her best friend, Amy Ayers. Eliza and Jennifer were working the closing shift that day, and since it was kind of slow, the hour leading up to closing time, which was 11, the two girls had began cleaning up and preparing for closing. Knowing that they had two extra sets of hands once all the customers left, they were super excited, right. especially because all four girls had this giant sleepover planned afterwards, okay. which no. was an even better excuse to trick your little sister and her friend into helping you clean up your yogurt shop. Right. Like, right. Earlier we leave, earlier we sleepover. The faster we can watch movies and eat chocolate and be crazy. So since Sarah and Amy were not old enough to work at the shop, they were hanging out in the break room, eating pizza that the older girls had ordered, and just like hanging out in the back of the store, laughing and doing everything that, you know, 13 and 15 year olds do. And at the front of the store, Eliza and Jennifer were working. So about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes before closing, the girls began sweeping, filling up the napkin holders, um, cleaning the machines, restocking the inventory, and Jennifer was cleaning the lobby while Eliza was behind the counter cleaning up, serving and checking out a last few like customers that had come in before closing. And the first person that is, you know, in this last 20 to 30, 15 ish minutes is a cop. And he's standing in line, and it's a pretty long line because people are rushing in to get some, like, late-night ice cream on a Friday night before going home. Yeah. Mainly to go. And he's in the line, and he's noticing that this younger man is ordering at the, you know, would get to the front of the line and be like, I'm not ready yet. You can go in front of me. And Was then, it, like, a place where you, like, you may not know the answer to this. Is it, like, you tell them what you want, or is it, like, our froyos where you get your... Your yogurt and no, they scoop it and top it for you. Okay. It, it's not like an orange leaf or a merch, okay. or merch whatever the other one is. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Like you go up and order. It's kind of like an ice cream shop, just a classic one. So as they're ordering, they're coming up, and you know these people are like, "Oh, I, I know what I want." And the guy's like, "Oh no, I don't know what I want yet. Go in front of me." And he does this multiple times. And then the cop is standing at the end of the line, and he's not in uniform or anything specifically, I don't believe, from the reports that I read. But when the man gets, the young man gets to him, he says, are you a cop? 
And the cop's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, well, you can go in front of me. I'm not ready yet. And the cop's like, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm okay with waiting. Because yeah. he got a bad vibe. So the guy goes in front of him. He orders a soda and then goes and sits down at a table. But he's acting super suspicious. So the cop just, like, makes a little note of it and leaves. So another one of the customers was a woman who was, like, towards the end of that crowd. So when she walked in, it was only her and the girls in the store. But then she notices... So she's going to pick up her husband's favorite ice cream on her way home from work, which is so typical. I mean, sir, it's like 10.45 at night. Right. And wow. going to Sonic after this at 11.30 and get a chocolate milkshake. Exactly. So she walks in. She's going to pick up her, her husband's favorite, you know, yogurt. And really no one's in the shop. It's just the girls. But as soon as she opens the door, she immediately feels uncomfortable. And she kind of like stops right at the entrance. But it wasn't because of the girls, it wasn't because it was late at night, it was because there were two other customers that were in a booth. It wasn't necessarily anything that the two other customers were doing, it was just her woman's like intuition, just their, present and their presence and their energy, something wasn't right, like something just didn't feel okay. So it was two younger men who were not eating any yogurt and they were sitting across from each other with a bag or sack in the table directly between them. And one of the men has his hands in the bag, like rolling around playing with something. And the other man is just kind of watching him do this, but they're not speaking. So since the man that had his hand in the bag had his back turned to the woman, she couldn't see his face. But the other man who was just kind of staring at him, she could. It was a younger man who was like tan skinned. She said, I would say he looks Hispanic to me, but he might have just been a darker skinned white man. So the woman is thrown off by this, but she orders from Eliza and she has the urge to ask her if she's okay. But the two girls were just like joking around, sweeping over each other's feet, giggling, smiling, and seemed fine. So she was like, maybe I'm just being crazy. Maybe everything's fine. And yeah. maybe this is like some awkward teenage love tension that's going on in this place and not anything bad. So the woman pays for her yogurt and she leaves. Well, a few minutes after, a couple stops in, and this is, like I said, we're in the, like, closing minutes of this restaurant. So they walk in, and they notice the same thing. Two younger men sitting on a booth that was farthest from the door, but closest to the register, with no food, no drink, and just a bag between each other, who are not speaking, not smiling, not And looking. not eating no. yogurt. Exactly. Something's not right. But they looked like they were listening to the conversations that the girls were having. Because of the weird vibes in the shop, the couple says, you know what, we were getting this to go, but instead we're going to sit down and eat it here until you close. Because they were like, we're not leaving these girls here with these two guys, right? So literally minutes before closing, the couple's like, okay, we have to go. Maybe they just know these guys and they're all just being weird. Like, we don't know. And it's main, the main reason they leave is because Jennifer and Eliza are, like, stacking up the chairs that are non-occupied, boxing up the ice cream that's left over, locking up the doors from the inside so no customers, new customers can come in, but customers inside can leave. Mm -hmm. And they, like, put the key in the door and, you know, they're, like, filling up the napkins. They're doing all the things. So they're like, okay, it's time to go. They probably just know these guys if they're still sitting here, you know, because that's rude. Um, but when the couple leaves, the two men stay at the table closest to the register and farthest away from the door, not speaking, not eating, just listening. We know that the girls finished all of their duties because the scene was assessed and all of the chairs were stacked and all of the napkin dispensers were full except for one booth. The booth closest to the register and farthest from the door. But what we don't know is, is exactly what happened after that couple left. Eliza and Sarah's bodies were found stacked in the back of the store that had, by a door that had been cracked open when firefighters had arrived on the scene, which was where the fire was believed to have began on a shelving unit. Laying beside Sarah and Eliza's bodies were, was Jennifer's body. It is thought that she had originally been stacked on them as well, but the force of the water coming in through the back door pushed her off. The primary reason for this is because, gore warning, 
Sarah's body was laying directly on the floor with Eliza stacked on top of her. And because of the heat, Sarah's body had melted into the floor. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Jennifer's body had not. So that's why they think she got knocked off instead of being there the entire time. 13-year-old Amy, the youngest of the group, she was found near the front of the store, and because she was not as badly burned and all of that, her body had a bigger story to tell. And it is gruesome, so major trigger warning for all of the things. Between Amy's spread legs was an ice cream scoop <gasps> pointed directly at her pelvic bone. Oh my gosh. On the scene, medical examiners performed a rape kit on each of the girls before transporting them to the medical examiner's office, which is typically a gigantic break from protocol. However, detectives wanted to forcefully break this protocol because they had lost already too much evidence to the water contamination and the fire that they did not want to risk transportation adding any more contamination to this crime scene. Yeah. So they were like, do it right here. I want to make sure that nothing happens here. I want it in the sealed boxes. So... This break from protocol really causes a gigantic issue between the detectives in the medical examiner's office, and they're like in this argument of some sort, and it's believed that in an act of anger, like blind anger, and just wanting to get the bodies the hell off the scene, the medical examiner's office did not swab the girls' bodies for accelerant, which is an absolute major fuck up, like point blank period. Yeah. If there's any sort of arson involved in any cases, you should swab. Right. So on top of the already contaminated, burned crime scene, this honestly is just too big for Austin's crime department already. Like, people are in shock when they're on the scene. They're forgetting everything that they're supposed to do because they've just never seen anything this awful before. And... I'm, I'm talking like simple things, such as dusting for fingerprints in the bathroom or non-burned areas, not wearing booties on the scene. And they left the lock of the back door that was already open when they left without taking it to take it in as evidence because they could have used it for fingerprints. They could have used it to see if it was tampered with again or if someone had exited, you know, like you can tell all that stuff. And they didn't take more than half of the things that you, they should have for evidence in the first place. So the autopsy reveals that all four of the girls had been shot in the head at least once with a 22 caliber, whereas mm. Amy had been shot twice with a 22 caliber and then a 380. All of the girls showed signs of sexual assault, and there was evidence that all of the girls, but specifically Amy, had been tortured before being killed. And lastly, $500 had been stolen from the register, and the register indicated that the cash had been taken out at 11.03 by Eliza. So, was this a robbery gone wrong, or were these girls the target? We don't know, which is similar to right. the Las Cruces bowling alley massacre. Sorry, I had a brain fart right there. Do you have any questions before I move on? No. Or anything to say? No, I'm already sold. Yeah. Descriptions, <laughs> the shooting in the back of the head. Right. So because of the lack of evidence, no security cameras, and really only three to four witnesses that police had, there was not a ton to work off of. Therefore, it was imperative for them to keep as much of the information as possible to themselves and highly classified so that they could look for certain details in a suspect's story that only the perpetrators would know to also rule out false confessions. And I know you guys are all making a face right now, like false confessions, who the fuck would ever falsely admit to a crime? Right. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, think. I wouldn't do that ever in my life. But literally close to 13 people falsely admitted it, admitted it, admitted to this crime. Like, within the first week of the investigation. It sounds like a gang to what, me. What, like, right, what do you have to gain from that unless you have some sort of gang mentality? Yeah. But literally, like I said, 13 people. As days went on and little bits of information would seep out because 
I'm not joking with you. This was like the craziest thing to ever happen in Austin. So people were like, hey, I know you know someone that works in the police department. Do you, can you tell me this, this, and this? Hey, I know you know someone who could work in the medical examiner office, and you know this, this, and this. And one of the examples of the story that got seeped out was through a hairdresser of someone who worked at the medical examiner's office. So that just shows you like how this was seeping out little mm -hmm. by little and, and hurting. Talking about it. Exactly. It's hurting the investigation in the end. But little by little, the suspect list grew and grew. I'm talking about reaching at least 350 Holy suspects. Shit. Yeah, 350. And a week after the merge took place, a man's name reaches the top of the list. And by a man, I mean a 16 year old. So a child. A child, a literal child. His name was Maurice Pierce. He had been arrested at the mall for an unrelated charge, and when he was arrested, he had a 20 caliber on him. Mm. When detectives brought him in for questioning, he immediately began to confess, but not that he had done it himself. He goes on to say that the night of the murders, he had let his friend, 15-year-old Forrest Wilburn, borrow the gun, and that he had murdered those innocent girls. So detectives go and find Forrest. Well, he says, I had no involvement with these murders whatsoever. In fact, the night of the murders, me and Maurice had been driving around that night with two 17-year-olds, Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen, which literally sound like fake names to me, but they're real people, by the way. Right, Michael Scott. <laughs> like, these are literally not real people. So, and by driving around, I mean, they stole a car and drove it to San Antonio. Nice. Yeah, and I'm like, you, well, you just admitted for to another crime. Great, I uh, love that. But how does that work as an alibi? Right. So police take the gun and they test it and they're able to determine that the gun was not the gun that was used on the girls according to ballistic testing. And after this, despite the psych psychological profiles that had been built for these offenders, um, they were honestly really specific yet really broad all in once. That's why I'm not even going to bother to like go through them. I'm sure we're already all thinking the same thing. Someone who's got like a big man, little man complex, a duo, someone that's yeah. the enforcer, someone that's, you know, always giving in a dominant, a submissive, two friends, two guys that live with their parents or kids and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So after all of this, months and years go by with no developments. In fact, this case was so traumatizing for detectives and other people working this case that Detective John Jones ended up having to take a month of leave because of PTSD linked to this case and almost causing his entire family to split up, split up because of the sheer hours and small team that he was working with, with the, and it was dwindling month by month. And this infuriated him because to the public, the police department is like, no, we're working on this case. We're not going to let it go cold. But he's sitting there watching them take his resources away and like basically make it to where the case is going to go cold because yeah. he doesn't have the resources that he needs. Either way, it goes cold, like obviously. And three years later, Detective Jones was promoted, therefore taking him off of the case. It wasn't until eight years later after the murders had taken place, that there were any developments in this case. In 1999, Hector Polanco was assigned as the head detective on this case. And he was going through the eyewitness accounts, the two young men in the booth, the back door being open, the front door having the keys still in it, one of the tables not being clean, the girls, how they were found, what was done to them, the fire, the money, the psychological profiles, and one thing kept popping out at him. Those four boys. So Detective Polanco calls all of them in, and now they're like well into their 20s, and he sits them all down for more questioning. Maurice and Forrest come in first. They were the two younger boys that were first connected, and they held firm that they were not involved with this murder at all. However, the older boys, Michael and Robert, well, not so much. They weren't as good. So Michael comes in and he says, like, no, I didn't have any involvement, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to put for you two people, there's going to be a picture of them up right now. He comes in, he's like, I had no involvement, blah, 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 blah. I, and then it turns into, well, I, you know, I was just a getaway driver. 
And then it turns into, well, I was the boy in the booth. And then it turns into, well, I sat at the booth with Robert while he shot all the people. And so they're like, so, so which, which is, what it? is it? You know, what's not clicking, Michael? And after hours and hours and hours, he finally says to the detectives, you know, I think I need a lawyer. So investigators leave. They're like, him. yeah, buddy. Yeah, they're you like, definitely. Yeah, do. you probably do. Except for that's not what they said at all. In fact, they leave the room and a few minutes they, after they return and they continue questioning him. And Michael keeps answering. So before I move on, if you're ever in this situation, first off, that's illegal. They <laughs> can't do that if you ask for a lawyer. But they're able to get around it because they said, well, you know, he was just thinking of getting a lawyer. He never acted on it. Therefore, we continue to question him. Right. Questioning him. So if you're ever in this situation and you say, I need a lawyer, or you ever think that you need a lawyer, you can shut the hell up at that point. You don't have to say another thing. And they can't force you to say anything once you ask for a lawyer. And don't say, I'm thinking about getting one. You need to say, I want a lawyer present right now. That's what you say. But if you're guilty, don't do that. Just say, in fact, you need to say, I think I need one. So good deal. Yeah, um, you think. Yeah, you think. So after seven hours of questioning, Michael finally admits that he was the one that shot the girls because Robert forced him to while pointing a second gun to his head, oh which God. is something that the public didn't know that there was another gun involved. So, oh, boom. bingo. At, at this point, police are like, all right, good deal. But then they keep pressuring him to the point that they make a finger gun with their hand and they put it up to his head. And they're like, is this what he did to you? Trying to like cause PTSD basically and make him remember it. Again, not a good tactic. I'm just gonna say, like, even if it's a finger gun, I get kind of nervous, especially if it's a police you officer. Nervous. I was really nervous right there. Yeah. <laughs> is that the Where you gonna shoot me? It's a finger gun. <laughs> but if it's a cop, I'm like, is that a real finger gun? Or did you got get a gun installed in your hand? Like, we're gonna, I don't have, to know. Put, we're gonna have to put a blurb on the YouTube. I know, actually. It's, with it. it's okay, everybody. Um so Sensor. police, you know, are doing all of these tactics, basically like trying to pull more information out of him and they are doing this and kind of trying they're trying to pull the information that the public doesn't know at this point all right like the fact that the girls were tied up with clothing and not string they were tied up with their own clothes okay so mike would be like yeah well maybe i tied them up with a cord and they're like no it wasn't a cord michael and they would be like what else did you use? And Michael would be like, well, maybe a t-shirt. And they're like, yeah, that's right. And then what did you do? So they're kind of probing him to get the answers they want, which right. it's not really. None of this will hold up in court, right? Well, that's what you'd think, right? So this goes on for the entirety of 20 hours in an interrogation room. I don't care who you are, if you did it, if you didn't do it, you're saying you did it. Like, you're yeah. done. Maybe not me, I would have been asleep in the floor at some point, but right. I'm telling you, like, this is bad, all right? And they did this to get the exact confession that they needed and wanted to arrest him. So then they bring in Robert, who's, I don't know what he's been doing for the last 20 hours, but I'm sure he's shitting his pants for yeah. sure. And once they get him in, they're using the same tactics. Yet he is way stronger, saying that police are coercing him, telling them that this is all I have to tell you. I don't get what you're understanding from me. I want to help you out, but I don't know anything about this case. I wasn't involved. I stole a car and I went to San Antonio that day. That's what I did if you want to arrest me for something. But hours and hours and hours go by and he breaks. But they still needed someone to say that they had, trigger warning, raped and sexually assaulted these girls. Major trigger warning about the things I'm about to say. So police needed it to be Robert since it wasn't Michael. So they go around and around in circles. And Detective Polanco is basically fed up at this point. And he goes, tell me how you raped them. 
And Robert says, quote, fine, I put my dick in her pussy. Is that what you want? Oh my God. And they shut off the entire interrogation, leaving them with the perfect in- confession. Polanco builds the theory that the 16-year-old Maurice was the mastermind behind all of this. 15-year-old Forrest was the lookout, and Robert was the aggressor, the rapist, and Michael pulled the trigger. This was taken to prosecutors and the court and evaluated, coming to the conclusion conclusion that due to the lack of evidence, Maurice and Forrest would not be tried. However, Michael and Robert would be tried for rape, murder, and arson. Michael and Robert were each tried separately. However, each of their confessions through were though at this point were recanted because they were like, that was coercion. We were mm-hmm. literally interrogated for 20 hours and told exactly what we needed to say to get out of there. At this point, it's obviously like recanted, but they were both used in the trials, meaning that they were not allowed to directly face and challenge their accuser, which is extremely unconstitutional in the United States. Like, if someone accuses you of something, they have to come to court and be a witness. Mm -hmm. And they weren't allowing this because that's why they tried them separately. This comes back up later, by the way. So there were two things in the confessions that would later be brought back up. One, what was used to prop the back door open. Neither of the men could agree on anything. Like, they, I don't even know what it was. I went through articles. I couldn't figure it out. I don't know if it was a rock, if it was, like, a stick. I don't know. But apparently neither of the men could agree on it. And the second one was that both of the men said that they doused the girls in accelerant after stacking them and lit them on fire. Well, if you remember... No one ever tested them for the accelerant because, one, the giant argument between the medical examiner's office and the detectives, and two, it everybody, like, even the firefighters, like, it didn't smell like accelerant. That doesn't mean that accelerant wasn't there. If you can't smell it, it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It could have been a small drop, you know? Mm -hmm. It could have been anything. Who knows? And it would have engulfed everything in flames, okay? But since... One of the things that we do know is that the women weren't what started the fire. It was the shelf, which was a small bit of information that I gave you right in the beginning. The shelf beside the back door is where the fire began. But they're saying that they started it on the girls. So because of this, the prosecution brings in specialists, and they have them reassess the evidence and test it for accelerant. And it was then determined that it was the bodies that were first set on fire. But, guys, this is 10 years later at the point that they're testing this. So how accurate is that? And how can you determine that 10 years later? You right. know, like... That sounds like a little bit of foul play on the police. It's a, it's a reach, yeah. at least. You know, it, this, this ends up turning into a big issue, all right? So either way, it didn't matter because Robert was sentenced to death and Michael was sentenced to life in prison. So after years of appeals being denied, they were finally able to get an appeal on the basis that neither of the men were able to confront their accusers, which, like I said, is extremely unconstitutional. So in 2006, Robert's conviction was thrown out and a year later, so was Michael's. However, they had to remain in jail until the prosecution and court determined whether to retry them. And the men's defense at this point does something bold. Like, I mean, you have to believe that your client is not guilty in order to do this. They request that all of the evidence, including the rape kit, which by the way, I haven't mentioned yet, came back with a male DNA sample on it, is tested, and compared with the DNA of Michael and Robert, with all of the new DNA technology that was had been developed in the last decade. So the court agrees, and it comes back as not matching either of the men, and it did not match Forrest or Maurice either. But the prosecution doesn't stop. They say, nope, that's, you know, that's not what it is, blah, 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 blah. There had to be a fifth man. Who are you not telling us about? And at this point, the defense is like, yo, just drop it. You got the wrong man. Put your guard down. Like, stop being so prideful and search for the people that actually did this. But instead of looking for the DNA of whoever done it, 
they tried super hard to get these men to go back to court, and they did. And they actually got it to where the DNA didn't have to be mentioned in the court, like, setting. Yeah. So then, the pro- I mean, the defense comes back and it's like, that was unconstitutional. Like, they des- the jury deserves to know. So then they present the jury with this information. And the jury recant- recants their determination of their sentences. And both of the men were let free with all charges dropped in October of 2009. And then more DNA testing was done. And a second male's DNA was found. But still to this day, the Austin Newgart shop murders have not been solved. I think that it's a, a game. Yeah, and they, game. that's why they... Had so many false confessions. Yes, because they're protecting someone. And that it was tied to the bowling massacre. Right. And I just think, like... You don't have that many false confessions. Like, no. you have maybe, like, oh, yeah, that that does look like me, but I wasn't there. Right. Like, I literally like, was not there. Yeah, like, the description does match me, but that, but I wasn't there. Like, you don't want people walking in, you know, tens and twenties of people right. walking in saying, I murdered those four girls. That's, like, the mentality of, like, what are they going to do about no, us? No, that's protecting somebody exactly. in a large group setting, a.k.a. A gang. A gang. And then, just to, like, tie it back to the Las Cruces bowling alley massacre, like, first off, well, we see a little bit of progression. A bigger fire. Less money stolen. Who knows? Oh, my God. I forgot there was a fire in the bowling alley. Yes. I totally forgot that. It's a bigger fire this time. And this time, they tied up each of the girls. It was young women that were involved. Mm -hmm. And this time, they made sure... After shooting them in the back of the head, which is the exact same as Las Cruces, they make sure to leave, and there's no evidence anywhere. Yeah. And it progresses still. So now we have a bigger fire. They're tied up. They've been sexually assaulted and raped. And all the other Because they were a little too confident. Exactly. And it's two men. Yeah. And no one ever saw what the other man looked like, so maybe it was the younger man that they saw. Right. And he shaved his mustache. And the older man had his hood up and his hand in the bag. Yep. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah. Because you know, like, that's... I would consider that the yogurt shop killings are a massacre. I know that yeah. the legal definition of a massacre is not that. It's over however many people. But four people, like, that's a Four gruesome. young girls, teenage girls. So, like, that, they clearly are getting off on large numbers of murders. Right. And they're getting... And it's all businesses. And, yeah. And it's all near the weekend. And I wonder if those girls' fathers, like, what were they involved in? That's what I wanted to know. And I also wanted to know who owned this franchise. Like, who owned that specific shop? Because did they have any involvement? Blah, blah, blah. I even tried to get on Were they needing to file for bankruptcy exactly and they one bad loan chart and that's what's going on exactly here. so i even like try to get on reddit and read a lot of things i was kind of pushing my notes today so if i find anything else i'll either pop on to the end of this or make a separate post about it but I, there's first off the areas cartel. are too close yes the areas are too Borrow close from the cartel they are They'll um, kill anyone. They don't give a shit. Exactly. Th- these areas are too close for me. The timing is way too back to back. And then on top of all the other little murders, and I mentioned in the last, well, they weren't little murders. They were murders. But, like, other cases that were similar, like, this seems like a re- Like, wh- why aren't these getting solved? So then, is this someone in the police force? That's... Yeah, whenever you said that the cop was there, mm-hmm. and he was like, I thought that's where we were going with this at first, that like the cop was there, but he was not in uniform, Right. and I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure if I dug deep on Reddit and got to some like back forums and shit, I could probably give you guys better answers on this, so feel free to do it, DM us about it. I'm sorry if my notes kind of seem spacey. I thought it, I thought you told it really well. Thanks. I've been kind of nervous it's about it. It's hard to talk shit like that, though. 
yeah, it's it's rough. I mean, it's just two weeks in a row me talking about young girls, and yeah. that bothers me really much. So, <sighs> at least there wasn't a 911 call. Hey, <laughs> all right, you ready to wrap this up? Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> listening. <laughs> what do we say at the end? Um, follow us on You Know What. Subscribe Instagram. to us if you haven't already. Click that five star button. Leave us a review, Leave girls a review. and boys. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube ASAP Rocky right now. Okay. Get on YouTube right now and just hit subscribe. And that is all. Love you. Bye. Enjoy a glass of wine. Are you going to say bye to them? Bye. <laughs> Thank you.